Uh, how about another hand for Grace Shepherd of Tucson Medical Center Healing Arts Program. Uh, my name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the final lecture in our Animalities series, a series where we ask you to suspend your anthropocentrism and try to see the world from the standpoint of animal agency. Uh, speaking of human agency, um, I want to give a shout out to our colleagues in the College of Veterinary Medicine who last week learned from the American Veterinary Medis Medical Association that they were allowed to bring in uh, their first class in the fall of 2020, and I want to congratulate <laughs> Dr. Julie Funk. I would you please stand, all of your colleagues from Vet Med, and take a applause. Wow. Thank you for being such great supporters of the series, and congratulations. Well, I have some people I have to thank, and um, it's a pleasure for me to do so because uh, we wouldn't be able to put the show on without them. And I want to start with Hello Alua Companies, Mike and Beth Kasser. Thank you very much for your support, Mike and Beth. <laughs> SBS Advisory Board members, Ken and Linda Robin, thank you both. <laughs> and our good friends at AZPM, our good friends, Dr. Svivi and Adib Sabah. <laughs> Dr. Barbara Starrett and Joanne Ellison. <laughs> Fox Tucson Theater. Thank you. We hope to be back next year. Uh, my good friends, Shana and Richard Oseron at Maynard's Market and Patricia Schwabi at Penka Restaurant, thank you very much for your support. <laughs> and last but not least, Park Tucson. Even if you park on the street, it's still because of Park Tucson. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kelsey Dale John. She is a postdoctoral fellow in the departments of American Indian Studies and Gender and Women's Studies in the College of SBS. And she received her PhD this year uh, in Syracuse, at Syracuse University in the field of uh, cultural foundations of education. Kelsey's areas of interest are Native American and Indigenous Studies and Women's Studies, uh, but more specifically, Colonial Settler Studies, Indigenous Education, Tribal Community Colleges and Universities, Indigenous and Decolonizing Research Methods, and Critical Animal Studies. She has uh, received funding for her graduate work and dissertation from the Navajo Nation, from the National Academy of Education, and the Spencer Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. And for such a young scholar, uh, she has published many book chapters and referee journal articles, and has presented at many conferences, and been invited to speak at many venues, such as this one. Of the referee journal articles, my favorite journal is one called Hume Animalia, uh, the subtitle of which is A Journal of the Human-Animal Interface Studies. And um, I'm going to give them a plug because it's an open access journal, so anyone who's interested can just go and log on and read whatever you want in this growing field of animal studies. Tonight's lecture is theoretical, historical, it's profound, it's also, as you will see, highly personal and deeply rooted uh, in her community. Please give a warm Tucson welcome to Kelsey John.
Yat eshk e doshin in e sh e kelsi jan yin a shye, bilagana e doshin ma, klash che e bashis chin, bilagana e doshin che, bit ane e doshin nale, a kot a na hok a di in dene e nishle, t is nas pas de na sha. Good evening, everyone. Um, what I just said to you in Navajo is our traditional introduction. So I said, hello, family and friends. My name is Kelsey John. My mother is white. My father's clan is the Red Bottom clan. My maternal grandfather is white, and my paternal or my paternal grandfather's clan is under the Arm clan, Navajo, and I'm from Tisnas Pass, Arizona. So I'm so pleased to be here with you tonight. Um, I wish that I could introduce you to my horse. I wish I could bring her on stage. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do that yet, um, maybe in the future. But tonight, um, I, I'd love to share with you a bit about my personal journey and story with horses and how it relates to education. Also, before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, the ancestral territory on which we're on, which is the Tahana Adam and Yaqui people land. And I encourage all of you to learn more about the original keepers and healers of this land. So I'm a horse person. Um, I grew up with horses. I can't actually remember the first time that I got on a horse because I was put on a horse when I was an infant. Um, and so horses have always been a huge part of my life. This is a photo of me on a horse when I'm about four years old with my mom um, at my grandpa's cattle ranch. So I've always had a relationship with horses and horses and I have really evolved together over time. We've evolved and learned together. I like to say that before I ever went to school and started studying education, I was a learner from horses. So horses were some of my first friends and some of my first teachers. Before I went to classes, I knew how to catch my horse, saddle him, ride him, feed him, and take care of him. And so I had that relationship for a long time. Sometimes people tell me that they're scared of horses, and I always find that so interesting because it's kind of like somebody saying that they're scared of grass or they're scared of rocks, <laughs> scared of something that has always been there um, and that has always been a, a friend. In the Navajo worldview, horses are healers. And the way that they heal us is by connecting us. So they might connect us to the land, they might connect us to each other, um, or they might connect us to our language and our tradition and our culture. But one of my favorite parts about horses is that no matter where you go, whether you're talking to Navajos or other native tribes or other people, they're always gonna be a horse lover in the crowd. I'm sure there's some in the crowd tonight. And so horses often connect people who might not have anything else in common. And that's a really beautiful thing. So I think the most important thing is they help us to connect one another. This is a photograph of my parents when they were young before they got married. And they come from two very different worlds, but what they did have in common was a foundation of horses and horsemanship. My mom grew up on a cattle ranch in Colorado, and my dad grew up on Navajo Nation, ranching and rodeoing and training Navajo Mustangs. So our family and our foundation was very much built upon the relationality and connectivity of horses in many, many different ways. I also grew up with Navajo Mustangs. So we grew up with a few horses from my maternal grandfather's cattle ranch, which were quarter horses, but we also grew up with Mustangs that came off of Navajo Nation. So I grew up in Oklahoma, um, spent most of my time away from my community at Navajo Nation, but I did grow up with little parts of my community who were these Navajo Mustangs. Um, this is a picture of a couple of them with my dad and my grandpa and some of the Mustangs that we had. Um, we took in these Mustangs. Uh, some of them were horses that were my grandfather's on the reservation. Um, and one of them in particular, which you'll see in the next photo, uh, is a horse that came from a, at a time when they were doing wild horse roundups on Navajo Nation. They usually leave the younger colts. So this was a horse that had kind of escaped that um, round up and wandered into my grandfather's corral and he kind of felt sorry for him and so he started feeding him, giving him water and then he came to live with us in Oklahoma where my dad trained him. 
So I've seen this training relationship um, for most of my life. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you using narrative, using stories. I'll tell you some stories about my companion horse and I, some stories about my community and about the land, but also some stories about policy and how all of these things weave in together with one another. Stories are very powerful because anything can have a story. The land has a story, animals have a story, humans have a story, and they all connect with one another. And also, you can have multiple stories. I might have multiple stories, the land might have multiple stories, and it's a really powerful thing. In many indigenous communities, stories are used as a form of knowledge communication, and so they're passed down um, from generation to generation for thousands and thousands of years. And that's how we, specifically as Navajos, transmit knowledge. Stories also can capture the interrelatedness or the worldview of a community. So for Navajo Nation, Navajo people, our stories talk about the interrelatedness and the connectedness between humans, land, and the animals. In our creation stories, animals are present. Horses are there with us from the very beginning of time. We're in relationship to them, in communion to them. But also, in our stories, horses have autonomy. And so they speak, and we learn from them. And they have a certain val um, valued and respected place within these stories as knowers and teachers. So before I get into the story about my companion horse, I want to give you a little bit of background information about Diné philosophy. Um, so in the Navajo worldview, it consists of a very delicate set of relationships that can be thought of as positive and negative energies, and they're contingent upon one another. Another way that this can be can characterized is as male and female energies. Now, this isn't the same type of male and female that we talk about in a Western society or a non-Navajo society, but rather, these are male and female energies that existed before humans, and they exist throughout all things. So in the land, the plants, the rocks, the animals, everything has a balance of these two intersecting and complementary energies. This picture represents the Navajo worldview in a number of different ways. In our worldview, we start with the east direction and we move clockwise around to the south, the west, and the north. This maps out our space where we were traditionally set as caretakers of the land by the holy people between these four sacred mountains, but it also maps out a spatial representation of our life philosophy. So this is important because our day can be mapped using this, where the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and then becomes dark in the north, which is nighttime, and then starts over again. It can also be a life cycle of a human. So from when you're young to when you're middle, young, <laughs> to older, and then finally to elderly again. So it really organizes our philosophy, our philosophy of education, and our thought on life. Finally, and most importantly, there's a horse for each direction. And this is very important because there are different colors of horses that represent each direction, and they represent maybe that time or that stage of a philosophy. So the four cardinal directions ground us as Navajo people, but they also have horses embedded within that too. So they're very deeply embedded in our whole organization of how we live. So every good story starts with a meeting point. This is my companion horse, Bambi. Um, Bambi is a five-year-old Mustang from Navajo Nation. And I met Bambi while I was volunteering at an equine rescue called Four Corners Equine Rescue in Aztec, New Mexico. I was working on my dissertation research, which was in partnership with Navajo Nation. And during this time, I was interviewing Navajo people about their horse stories and horse knowledges. Well, at the same time, I was away from my own childhood horses, and so I felt a little bit off balance and disconnected. So I started volunteering at this equine rescue. When I met Bambi, I learned about her story, which is that she was picked up with a herd of free-range horses near Nyese, New Mexico, by the New Mexico 
livestock board. So when horses get onto the highway on the reservation, then they become state property. So when the New Mexico Livestock Board picked up these horses, the equine, local equine rescues come in and see which horses they can adopt. So when I met Bambi, she had been at the rescue for about two years um, and had an, another person who was previously working with her. And when the owner of the rescue told me her story, she said, yeah, there was someone who was working with her, but her friends convinced her that because she was a Navajo Mustang, she was going to be dangerous. She was going to be too dangerous to adopt. And so then that individual didn't end up adopting her. So I thought that was a very interesting story. <laughs> so I immediately um, kind of was drawn to Bambi because of that. Um, because as a Navajo and as a Native American person who often gets labeled with all kinds of things, I know what it feels like to be in that position. And I think, you know, a lot of people know what it's like to be labeled. So we started um, working together. Now, it wasn't always a smooth sailing. Um, when I first met her, she wouldn't even let me walk up to her. Um, it's pretty clear that she had had either no human contact or had had very little or negative human contact prior to her time at the rescue. And so this is an early photo that I took of her, and I was actually not the one who haltered her, but this was about as close as I could get to her. So she was kind of distrusting and trying to um, feel me out, was a little unsure about me, and she was scared of everything. She was scared of ropes, um, brushes, other humans, you name it. Um, she was very challenged, or challenged by the fear of those or the unknown of them. So you can sort of tell in this photo, her ears are forward, her feet are braced, <laughs> very um, sturdy in a sturdy way, and she's not looking too comfortable. But you'll see over time uh, that she does change and she becomes more comfortable with me and I with her. So my relationship with Bambi, um, we went through a set of, of training uh, exercises together over the course of a year at the equine rescue and it's a wonderful place because they train volunteers in natural horsemanship which is uh, the most gentle and relational type of horsemanship and training. So I learned more about natural horsemanship techniques and I was also learning more about my community's philosophy of the horse all at the same time that I was working with Bambi and, and helping to um, train her. Well, <laughs> she'd probably tell you that she was training me. Um, <laughs> So the training relationship is great. It's like a dialogue. Um, it's like a dialogue or a kind of a dance. A dance, I like to call it a dance of intuition. And the reason is that horses really communicate with you a lot. But they don't verbally communicate. Occasionally they do. Um, but they're not speaking to you in English. But what they have to communicate with us is actually very profound. And this was something I knew to kind of tune into from watching my family's training relationships, but also from the knowledge I was learning from my own community members as well. So this dance of intention is really about asking and trusting and a back and forth. So this is kind of a short video clip that I took. It's a very routine day with Bambi and I in the round pen. What I'm doing is I'm just documenting that I'm able to halter her. Super easy, very like routine, basic, everyday thing. I probably have done this with her a thousand times, and this is about eight months into our relationship. But you can see very clearly that there's this back and forth. There's this intention between the two of, or between the two of us, and um, it's kind of powerful. It's like a dance. So I'll just have you watch this clip and kind of analyze yourself.
So here we are. This is something that we do every single day, sometimes twice a day. And I love this clip because there's this definite back and forth. It almost reminds me of a dance, right, that's trying to portray a very complex conversation. Um, and you see that we have this respect in what each other wants. Um, and there's no kind of forceful movements in that. Uh, you can tell a lot. You can say a lot from just such a short clip. So what I really want to do tonight is to sort of frame this story of Bambi and I, now that you have some background knowledge, really in kind of a theoretical basis. And so when I met Bambi, I was doing a lot of the analysis and writing of my dissertation. And so in a lot of ways, I think that Bambi is kind of the core of the analysis of my data and the stories that I was getting um, from my co-participants and co-narrators on Navajo Nation. And the reason being is that in these complex interactions that we had, she was asking me questions. And so tonight I wanna share with you three major, big, theoretical, deep questions that Bambi was asking me during this time and how it relates to education and research um, and also policy as well, too. It weaves in really nicely. So the three questions are, what is wild? What is education? And what is science? Bambi's really smart. <laughs> the first question is, what is wild? So this has always fascinated me, simply because I grew up with wild Navajo Mustangs. However, these were the horses that my parents put me on when I was three, four, five years old. <laughs> and so I always wondered about that. Um, and so I started thinking about the frames that I have as a indigenous studies person and also a gender and women's studies person and thinking about the word wild and what it has meant for our history and, and the characterization of not only animals, but also humans as well, too. So wild is interesting because it's this word that has been used to characterize native peoples as well in the history of the US. Um, and it's all often juxtaposed with its counterpart, domestic, wild and domestic, or maybe wild and civilized. And so the more I sort of got into this, the more I realized that wild is a trope that has sort of dominated the American narrative, and the idea of taming the wild has also dominated the American narrative. I think this photo represents this really, really well. Um, this is called Manifest Destiny, and many, as many of you might know, Manifest Destiny was sort of an underlying religious philosophy that was driving the colonization of the Americas. It's the idea that it is the duty, both religiously and politically, to bring civilization to the wild, wild west, including the people and the animals. So in this photograph, um, it moves from right to left, um, in kind of a swoop of civilization. You can see that on the left side, it's not only darker, but there are indigenous folks, there are bison, um, indigenous folks riding horses, there's dogs. And then as you move to the civilized side, you see that there are power lines, uh, trains, and there's also a farm, which is a fenced in kind of set plot that embodies this Western idea of agriculture. And then, of course, in the center, you have a woman who embodies an angel, and she's carrying a Bible and then carrying the strand of the power, the electricity that's, that's running through. So this is an interesting painting because in a lot of ways it really represents the American narrative of progress and taming the Wild West, but you can see that it's not only a narrative that envelops people, but one that also envelops land and animals as well. 
In the wild and domestic binary, it also gets caught up in the system of education. So the civilizing project was not only a land project, but also an educational project. This is most evident in the residential boarding schools that Native American people were forced to attend. In these schools, um, these individual Native people were taken from their homes, their communities, their languages, their religions, their land, and also, of course, their animals as well. Boarding schools were also an incredibly gendered project. So in these schools, the gender roles were taught to Native American individuals. And in a lot of ways, they were reversed or new. So for Navajo women, we have always been on the land with the animals. We were sheep herders, horse trainers, horse women, um, agriculturalists, we were involved in all these parts of life. And even more specifically, in Navajo society, it's a matriarchal society, meaning that land and livestock belong to and are passed down through the female line as well. So Navajo women always had control over economic and political issues, but going to boarding school it was a very different um, curriculum there. So I love this photo because it kind of shows the domesticated um, education that these Native American women were receiving at boarding schools that were removing them from the political and economic spheres of society, both Native and also non-Native society. So in Bambi's question to me, <laughs> um, I always felt like she was asking me, am I wild because you can't ride me? And what does that mean? So when I first started working with Bambi, I could hardly even walk up to her, much less ride her. And I've grown up riding horses, so I know it's powerful, it's very meaningful. Um, and I always saw that a little bit as the end, right? The end of our relationship. Um, but what I really started to realize is that when Bambi was acting wild, it was when she was resisting violence or resisting pressure coming from either a relationship or maybe the structures around her. So she's a free-range horse. She was out on Navajo Nation until she came to the equine rescue where she was put in a smaller pen, right? And so this kind of spatial pressure makes perhaps a horse act wild. Um, and so I also thought too about how this, this intersected with the training relationship. So I'm sure many of you have heard the, heard the word break before, breaking horses. And I hate this word <laughs> because um, in the training relationship, what I learned that I think is most important and also quite gendered is that you can't force a horse to do anything. And if you're forcing them or you're using dominance or fear, then that's actually something that's quite violent and problematic. And so what I like to say instead is that the training relationship is really about reciprocity and there's a difference there. So the reason why I say this is gendered is because in gender studies, we like to critique the social constructions of femininity and masculinity. What I mean by that is not that there are any innate qualities that are male or female, but rather there are these social constructions. So with masculinity, it's oftentimes constructed as being good to be violent or dominant or sort of domineering and aggressive, whereas femininity is often characterized as being, you know, making yourself small or being pleasant and conversational, maybe more relational, more caring. Um, and what I learned is that oftentimes trainers try to really embody masculine qualities in the training relationship. And what actually is more effective, I believe, are stereotypically feminine qualities, which are qualities of relationality and care. And so I think this really pushes back not only on the taming of the wild, Western narrative, but also the narrative that horsemanship is something that is um, male-dominated as well. So this story um, of nomenclature is also a policy story as well. So in 2013, um, the 
fate of wild horses became a national conversation. This is one of many New York Times articles that covered the situation of a high range of free, or high um, number of free range horses, both on Navajo Nation, but also in BLM lands and other indigenous nations um, in the US. So at this time, basically, what the conversation was summarizing is that um, horse slaughter had previously been legal in the United States, and people were kind of pushing back against this because the main way of dealing with high free-range uh, horse populations was rounding them up and oftentimes sending them to slaughter plants or, or sending them off um, to slaughter plants in other areas as well. So the reason why wild is important in this characterization is that depending on what you call a horse or consider it to be can in some ways situate its life or its fate in the policy world as well too. So wild is thought to be something that is not only an animal with no human contact or no domestication, but also an animal that has evolved on the North American continent, right? Sort of um, aside from human interaction or human interference as well. Whereas a feral horse is a domesticated horse that has sort of gone off into the wild. It's had previous human contact or perhaps its ancestors have had human contact as well. Um, the other definition of horses is domesticated horses. And so I always question too the markers of domestication as well because it's usually human serving purposes or corrals, confinement, um, brands, or maybe a utilitarian purpose as well too. The one characterization that I did not see though in all of these policy conversations was clean, and that is the Navajo word for horse. In Navajo, horses are not simply domestic or wild, but they're horses, and those horses are our relatives. And so in, in the relationship of thinking of them as domesticated, it kind of doesn't make sense in the Navajo worldview because you can't own your sister, right? You can't own a family member. And so this is really where the clash of definitions, not only of what we call these horses, but the worldview behind what we name the horses and then enact the policies becomes problematic. And I'll speak more toward the end about um, the developing policy on, on free-range horses, both on Navajo Nation and, and beyond. So I think this goes back again to, is wild simply resisting violence or resisting domestication or maybe resisting an anthropocentric, human-centered, utilitarian purpose in our lives? Um, and I think that Bambi and I kind of sort of came to that question because there was a point at which I thought I may never be able to ride Bambi and that's really what I would like to do, right? That's what kind of brings me joy as a human, but if she doesn't want that, then it's not gonna happen and I have to respect that. I also think about Bambi pushing the limits on wild because she thrived without human contact on Navajo Nation, kind of fending for herself. No one was feeding her, giving her water or trimming her hooves but she's also now thriving in my care as well. And so I think about the interesting ways that not only mustangs, but other animal species make us question and push the boundaries of what it means to be wild or domesticated. The second question that Bambi pushed me toward in our conversations is, what is education? Now, I'm an educational studies scholar, um, so I'm always asking this question, what is education? Or maybe more specifically, what does it mean to be educated? And who do we turn to as a teacher or as a knower? And this is a, a photograph of my dad. He is also a horse trainer and where I learned a lot of, of methods from. Um, and this is one of the first times that he met Bambi. And him being the skilled horseman that he is, I was really having trouble picking up her feet to clean out the under part and trim them. And she just would not pick up for her feet for me. And the first time he met her, she's like, picked it right up and there it went. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so he's very skilled. <laughs> 
When I say that horses are teachers, it's an idea that's very grounded in the Navajo worldview. And the reason for that is that we see these animals as holding a set of knowledge that we do not have, a set of knowledge and skills that we as humans do not have, but also that we respect them for that knowledge too. Um, and so whenever I have someone meet my horse for the first time, I always tell them, remember, she's stronger than you, she's smarter than you, and she can read your mind. <laughs> now go. <laughs> but it's true, and so, um, and so, from, this is what I learned as a Navajo person, right? From many deep and complex ways, but mostly from watching my dad interact with horses, is that approaching them as if you truly believe that they are smarter than you, stronger than you, and they can read your mind, will totally change the conversation and the relationality, and you will look to them as, as teacher. So as I mentioned, horses can read your mind, um, and I love this because this is a quality that makes them so skilled as an educator. And they'll educate you in many different ways, um, some of which you might be open to, others of which you might not. So this is another one of our family horses. His name is Major, um, and he is uh, also a Mustang too from Navajo Nation and this is my dad's horse. I was home this summer training horses at my parents' ranch, and I got to ride him a lot, almost every day. So Major's way of reading my mind is that he, along with other horses, often put a mirror up to you or sort of point at your biggest flaw in their attempt to help you fix it. Um, all, of course, in the, in the best interest of them. Um, so as I was riding Major, one of the things that we don't really allow our horses to do because it's disrespectful is to eat while we're riding them. So it would be kind of like if I was up here eating a hamburger during this talk, you might think it's a little bit disrespectful. <laughs> or you might just want me to share, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so as I was riding Major, he would continuously do this, and I realized that what he was doing was trying to push me to my limit to see how I would react and to help me learn to control my reactions to him, control my emotions, control what I do when what I don't want happens or when I don't actually have control. Um, very subtle reminder on his part. So I, I snapped this picture because I thought it was funny. He, he's all saddled up and has his bridle on and everything, and you can tell in his face he's got... He's got a snack, <laughs> and he's happy about it. <laughs> so the educative relationship with a horse is something that I think should be learned from and also mirrored in education relationships um, in institutions of higher learning, but also you know K through 12 settings as well. And this is because it's an ethical and reciprocal one. So in a lot of ways, it can be thought of as a knowledge exchange. Um, in Bambi and I's relationship, I was teaching her things that would help me care for her. So picking up her feet was a big one um, because when she's not out on the rocks, she can't trim and chip her hooves herself. And so you don't want them to get too long. It's bad, bad for their feet and their joints and their whole posture. Um, so it took us a while to get to the point where she was okay. Now you can tell in this picture, it's very lovely. She's just like <laughs> looking back like, oh, it's great. You've got my foot. Um, but. I realized that as I was simply picking, teaching her to let me pick up her feet, she was teaching me all of these more in-depth conversations and lessons about education. But there came a point in our training relationship where there was a real willingness for both of, I, both of us to enter into the round pen together because it was an exciting and educational space, right? What are we gonna learn next? What thing are we gonna overcome together next? What fear are we gonna get past? You know, what anxiety are we gonna push past? What are we gonna teach each other in the round pen today? And then how can we take that beyond? Also, I continuously um, challenge the sort of ending point, too. As I mentioned earlier, there was a time at which I thought I may never be able to train Bambi um, to, be, to be ridden, and so I had to really think about what it is that horses have been used for historically and how it is that we 
have a utilitarian view of characterizing not only horses, but other animals, and then in turn the land too. So looking at these beings that as Navajo people we believe are our relatives or are alive, we can't simply use them for utilitarian purposes. And that's a really kind of deep and important lesson. Which brings me to Bambi's final question, which is, what is science? Huge question, um, but I think maybe more easy to understand if I say, what is knowledge? And the sort of sub-questions with that are, what types of methods do we use to gain knowledge? Who do we listen to? And what types of knowledges do we value? So. I work for university, um, and so it's a knowledge-producing community, right? We do research, we do education, um, but I think that what horses teach us are equally important to the pursuits that we have at the university and research level. Science and the scientific method have been sort of the privileged methodology of knowledge collection, and certain communities have been privileged for their knowledge. But the reason why I come to this is that um, it's a very important concern for indigenous peoples as well. As indigenous peoples, we see science as a set of relationships. And I think that scientists who are non-indigenous would also agree that this is true too. But I think the relationships that we look at as indigenous peoples might be a little bit different, or they have different rules, or they have different instructions that we live by. And so this really questions um, power structures and what types of knowledges are privileged, but also where it is that we look and how much we privilege that relationality before it is that we, before we gain the data or the knowledge. And so that's one that goes back to the reciprocal, respectful, and educational set of knowledge as well, too. In indigenous communities, stories are our knowledge. And so all of our science, all of our policy, all of our social society rules, our environmental rules, they're all embedded in our stories. You can go to any university in this country and find a thousand books on Navajo philosophy. However, what you will seldom find is that philosophy being acted out or listened to. And the reason is that our philosophies and our stories have often been characterized as simply just that, myths or stories, and not scientific. And the reason for this is that I think a lot of times it's really easy to collect and consume indigenous knowledges without actually listening to what it is that they have to say. In the same way that I could kind of collect and consume knowledge from Bambi without actually listening to what she has to say and how it applies to my actions as a researcher and as an educator. I like to say it's all kind of fun and games to, to research Navajo or native philosophy because it's not really real. But what would it look like if we did listen to these relationalities and understand that we are meant to have relationship with the land, that there are original caretakers to land, original caretakers to animals, right? That horses actually didn't come over with the Spanish but evolved here and have been here since time immemorial. What does it mean to enact those in education and in research and then finally in turn in policy? So I want to return again to the policy story and some history on the, the high number of free-range horses on Navajo Nation. In the 30s and 40s, the U.S. government conducted research on Navajo Nation and they brought in non-Navajo, non-native anthropologists um, and researchers to take a look at the land. What they determined is that the land was, was that the land was being overgrazed and that there were too many horses and too many livestock and specifically sheep. So the solution, the policy solution to this was to put a cap on the amount of livestock that each Navajo family could own. And this was devastating because any family that had over that cap, that amount of livestock was slaughtered. So this is a traumatic event um, in Navajo history, and it's something that has really changed 
and, and put a challenge in for our relationships to our land and to our animals. So a lot of times people like to look at the high number of free range horses on Navajo Nation without knowing this policy story, without knowing that two generations ago, you know, our livestock were slaughtered by the US government. And I think that what's even more deeper to this policy story is that there's a clash in worldview that informs research. So the researchers coming in without an understanding that livestock, horses, sheep are family, right, that the land is alive, to come in and enact this policy is absolutely devastating to a community that is completely organized and contingent upon these relationships. Scholars have offered some other alternative explanations for why the range was characterized as overgrazed, and I think these are really interesting, some of which include that it's simply a move to put a cap on expansion and to continue enacting confinement. So reservations by themselves are spaces of confinement to confine native peoples and native land, and the policy of livestock slaughter kind of just continues that as well. One of the second is that there was a very gendered perspective to this too. As I mentioned earlier, Navajo women were sheep herders, they were livestock owners, and after the livestock slaughter happened, grazing policies were enacted on Navajo Nation through the US government, and these policies put land and livestock in ownership of male names. For Navajo society, this totally switches everything around, really changes our relationship that is managed in a different kind of way to our land and our animals. One of the third explanations that indigenous scholars offer is that the land was characterized as overgrazed because of the effects that it would have on the, the Hoover Dam. So knowing where, where the Navajo Reservation is located and having too much runoff would impede the construction of that dam and then in turn impede energy sources for non-indigenous communities as well. So today, there are over 38,000 free-range horses on Navajo Nation. This is a photograph of, of some of the herds on Navajo Nation that are near where my family lives, um, in Tis Nas Pass. And this is a highly controversial topic because there's a lot of contextualized history in the gendered, educational, and land policy changes that have been enacted on our community that we didn't necessarily ask for <laughs> historically. Um, so a lot of a lot of people that I've talked to have sort of proposed that the change from free range grazing to grazing permits and fenced in areas has caused a rise in the number of high um, of free range horses on Navajo Nation, but also that there's kind of a, a healing and a recovery to be done in the community around our relationships to land and animals. And so um, my work is dedicated to as a Navajo person, creating these spaces where Navajo people can engage with horses in the way that we already know how. And I'm certainly not the only person who's doing this. There are many others on Navajo Nation that are doing this as well. But I do challenge people to think that there's not simply a, num a high number of free range horses on Navajo Nation because Navajo people can't or don't take care of their horses. It's actually way more complex than that with a, a, a violent history of land and animal policies that have been enacted on my community. I also like to use this example to kind of return to the idea of wild and domestic and what that means. Oftentimes domestic characterizes that a human is in relationship to that animal. But actually on Navajo Nation, these free range horses, they're not domesticated, but they're still in relationship to the people out there because of where they are on the land, because of how they fit into our worldview and our creation stories. These are some more free range horses uh, currently on Navajo Nation. And I like to go running out there with my dog. And I often talk to these horses while I'm out there running. I'm not saddling them. I'm not riding them. I'm not sticking them in a corral. I'm not feeding them. But I'm still in relationship to them in a meaningful way. And so I think this really pushes what, what it is that we call domesticated relationships and maybe what they actually should be. 
Finally, to situate Bambi back in this, this is our, our herd, my family's little herd of horses, um, Mustangs and quarter horses, and they're in the rain too, so they don't look happy in this picture. Um, and poor Bambi's the one in the front, she's left out. She was new, the newest to the herd, so she got left out of the shed. Um, <laughs> so really the story about Bambi is Kind of a sweet story, right? How can it not be? Um, but it's also a very deeply historical and political story about these free range horses, about Navajo worldviews, about the clash of science and the way that science and worldviews inform policy and then really complicate things for land and horse um, relationalities and native communities. So as I mentioned, um, my work is to promote and create spaces of horse education. So this is a conference that I did to sort of sum up my dissertation research. It was called Flint Bean do Flint Bahane, which means horse songs and horse stories. And the conference subtext was connecting, horses connecting communities across Navajo Nation. The wonderful thing about this conference was that it was held at a tribal university, Navajo Technical University in Crown Point, New Mexico. So it was held on Navajo land. It was a space where we could share our songs and our stories and younger people could hear them. I learned a lot um, that, that education was passed down in the way that we used to pass it down before formal schooling came into, came into the picture. It was also cool because we had a live horse demonstration on campus. And so we set up a round pin behind the gym and you can see on the left side that uh, I invited a horse trainer from the community to come and do a training demonstration and then to relate that back to education. So this was a space that brought together not only students and faculty at the university but also local ranchers, horse trainers, grazing officials, policy people, to all remember and center the sacredness of the horse and to start our conversation from that place. And so this was a, a, a wonderful event that I hope will continue annually um, at this university or maybe different spaces in the community as well. So I just wanna um, uh, also kind of put a plug in for this as well. If any of you are interested in this, please feel free to contact me. Um, and also if you're interested in donating to Four Corners Equine Rescue, I would encourage you to do that. That was where Bambi came from um, and where we had our training relationship before I adopted her. And just so you know, she's in Tucson with me now. So she she's boarded at a facility just down the street from me. And so we hang out every day um, and we're still doing well. Uh, so I just want to thank you and um, Bambi wants to thank you. <laughs> That was great. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and for uh, attending so many of uh, these lectures. And then not last, I want to give um, a big shout out to my compadre in all of this uh, organizing, the Associate Dean uh, in the College for Community Engagement, Dr. Maribel Alvarez. Thank you all for coming.